the advanced PAP features are this uh, APAP, and then pressure support, and then backup rate, and then here's the relative expense. Now, if you put in a trilogy, what's the trilogy expense? It's about seven thousand dollars. Eight thousand, yeah, seven to eight. Seven to eight thousand dollars. So that's why the uh, Hastings, as well as uh, medical service company, are all kind of like at the at the door at UH. Uh, they know that the pulmonary, the sleep people don't like to use it, but they know that the pulmonary people uh, want somebody else to take care of it. So a trilogy uh, is the, what, what all the social workers are told you can you can get going out the door if you have COPD or you have something. So this is the summary. OSA. OHS and CSA for CPAP. Now, I know this always surprises uh, Kamal because he, you know, the CPAP for uh, chain stokes, you don't use a large pressure. BiPAP for obesity, hypoventilation, neuromuscular disorders, and opioids, at least initially, not very good. ASV for chain stokes, uh, central sleep apnea. Uh, emergent sleep apnea, that is uh, central apneas, and then opioids, and opioids for VAPs and neuromuscular disorders and obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Mainly VAPs for neuromuscular disorders. So that's sort of the summary. So now we'll go through the different, the different uh, modalities. But this really tells you where the literature, literature falls and why you're asked to sort of try CPAP, try BiPAP, try BiPAP ST, and then move on to ASV and to, uh, and to VAPS, and that's because of the cost implications for those things. 24-year-old chief complained of falling asleep while waiting on tables in the dining room of the Pickwick Club. Well, I don't know. Obesity hypoventilation syndrome, BMI greater than 30. 40% of the state of Ohio has a BMI greater than 30. Wait, really? Yep. 40%? Yep. Truck drivers, it's about 55%. Wow. Now, wake PACO2 of 45, I, I, I know that's what it says. I think that's what it says now on ICD-3. But I really don't think about it until it's over 48 or so and it's accompanied by an increase in bicarbonate or upper level of bicarbonate and the absence of other causes is a lung and neuromuscular disorder and reason for that your thought about with the company increased bicarb is the proof that it's a chronic issue that actually has effect is that right or is that just a general thought that has to no, in my in my mind, I think you want to have. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, when I sit there and I have somebody, is they have a PCO two and their obesity and their lung function and neuromuscular function is, is is fairly good, is in an obese range, and then you find that they have uh, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, which is a wakefulness diagnosis, and if you have a blood gas, that's that's good, but if you have a bicarbonate, that's sort of like your hemoglobin A1C for that disorder. Right, right. right. So I think of it as being something that you look at, and, and uh, Francis Chung uh, has incorporated that into the stop bang to be able to look at bicarbs that are greater than, I think, 29. Oh. And then uh, they kind of put that in there. Now, how many sleep apnea patients have a bicarbonate greater than 29? A lot. Um, so what's the PCO, PACO2 in simple obesity? That is a BMI of 40, no sleep apnea, no problems with lung function, otherwise walking around and doing pretty well. Well, let's, first, let's, 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 let's go first. What's your blood gas that is a normal blood gas for a PaCO2? What's the range? 
Uh, and and the will say, depending on the source, 35 to 45, but yeah. the average number yeah, that's will be pretty, That's pretty big, but it's usually 38 to sort of like 42 or maybe 44. <laughs> yeah, with the, it's like 7, 4, 40, and then right. what they've been right. That's what you think of in your rule of thumb. And so the two right. standard deviations is where you get the where you get the 45, but I don't know. So if you have a person that has simple obesity, What's their their PaCO2 when they are awake, sitting there in a blood gas uh, in a lung function lab? And they did like thirty of those versus thirty with see with uh, with, uh, with 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 sleep apnea. I say they have the same. I mean, in an absence of any underlying uh, issues, I would assume. It's okay. So what it is, 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 is that it, the, the range in those simple obesity is like 36 to 40, 35 to 40. They actually hyperventilate. Hmm. Now, why do they hyperventilate? And their bicarbonate level is usually a little bit lower, too. The reason they do is because they have um, their chest wall. Uh, is receptors, they have a smaller lung volume and their chest wall receptors are having them breathe more. The other is they often have some atelectasis and have a little bit of a lower O2, but since it's a curvilinear relationship between uh, PaO2 and ventilation, uh, they're, they're, they could have a blood gas of say a PaO2 of 68 or 70, right? Not just at the lower nor normal, but they could overbreathe a little bit. So they generally hyperventilate. So that's uh, that's a uh, and because of control of breathing. So the, if if you look at a person and they have a bicarbonate's a little bit higher and they get a blood gas and the PaCO2 is 45 or so, it's probably reasonable to say they have some degree of sleep disorder breathing. And why is the bicarbonate level elevated during the day when this thing is happening only at night? Right. Mm -hmm. What? Why? What? I mean, it's only night, so it should be you wake up and you're fine, right? Turns out to be that what happens when you're asleep is the degree of CO2 retention that you have during sleep then gets your kidneys to, to then compensate and give your bicarbonate. So it goes up, oh, very little. But it does it 365 days a year for three, four, five years, and then it go, Then you, you crank it up. So that's how that happens. It's like hemoglobin A1C then. Okay, all right. PAP therapy for OHS. You can use all these. They've all been shown. You have this, and the problem then became, you know, what do you, what do you use first? And the studies that, we, that you guys should kind of know about is you start off with CPAP, because uh, it, CPAP resolves sleep disorder breathing and hypoxemia in 57%. 43% uh, though continue to have some nocturnal hypoxemia, but it all improves them and their bicarbonate levels uh, uh, their, and their PaCO2 go down. I did a study with Fang Han in China in which uh, I, I think it was published in, I don't know, it was chest I think, in which he took a group of people and did CO2 responsiveness, hypoxic responsiveness, P.1, before and after uh, CPAP for people that had, uh, uh, well, and those with P, the higher PaCO2s, they improved their PaCO2, they improved their O2 during the day, they improved their CO2 response, they recruited, so it's, they, they improved in general. What he didn't do, which would have been the perfect, is he didn't do the, do the people that didn't put them the, the people with a PaCO2 that was normal, that is 45 or lower, because I bet they even they even dropped their PaCO2 as well. Okay, so you know you go on with try CPAP and go to BiPAP. CPAP and OHS predictors of failure to continue to be hypoxemic, greater levels of obesity, so BMI of 60. 
more time below a saturation of 90% during the diagnostic study is greater than 20% 20, 20 of total sleep time. And uh, ABGs and uh, spirometry are comparable to people that respond or don't respond. But, uh, those that have uh, a preferred BiPAP have more resting hypercapnia, more airflow limitation, which means that they probably have some degree of lung disease. There are people that think that pulmonary hypertension occurs in sleep apnea only in those people that have some degree of lung dysfunction by either COPD or by heart failure. So CPAP or BiPAP, maybe it's an editorial. And if they don't have sleep apnea, that is they only have sleep hypoxemia by levels. Okay. Yeah. ST mode should be used in all with central hypoventilation or impaired respiratory drive. And that's the practice parameters 2010. This is uh, one of the original uh, or studies after that, 10 patients with a spontaneous mode, S mode, increased respiratory event, spontaneous central and mixed. And then uh, backup rate, high backup rate associated with more awakening. So probably this is an editorial, but the idea is that uh, when do you set your backup rate? Do you need to look at the original sleep study to see what breathing they had? Uh, some people have a slow respiratory rate, even in the absence, in the presence of sleep apnea and they're resting. So you sit there and you assume that it's, it needs to be 16, say, and their, and their regular rate is 14, they'll over breathe. And dropping the backup rate is fairly important. Ambrose makes the point that even when you're using CPAP and you have an expiratory uh, relief, that is during expiration, you have a drop in three centimeters of water as you begin expiration, that actually is a form of ventilation. So all those things need to be taken care of before you go on to buy uh, to BiPAP. So quick question here, with the backup rate, um, I think there, you know, usually you do not want to set the backup rate higher than the patient's regular respiratory right. rate. You know, for example, 13, 14, and we do it minus two or minus three, whatever. Right. Right. But there's also, it's probably specifically for newer muscular disease, if I remember correctly, that we want to set up the backup rate that are around their respiratory rate or even a little bit higher so that they, their respiratory can get adequate rest. Just like completely. I, I don't know if that's been tested. Breathing. I don't know if that's been tested empirically, Moshi. You know, that's that's something you can look at. I don't know if that's really well known. Now there is this. I think uh, they talk about it in the acute setting um, to, to attain muscle rest in the acute setting, but I I don't know the chronic setting. What I've read is that you you need to maintain the respiratory drive so you keep it you know two or three two about two breaths under their rest. The resting respiratory rate. You try not to overbreathe, and the major thing that happens is that you can keep people having avoiding central apneas if you have them have um, a a rise in CO two during sleep. What's the normal rise in CO two during sleep? Okay. What number? About four in adults. Yeah, four four millimeters of mercury. And it happens in healthy people. It happens even in COPD. They don't have sleep apnea. So even if they have a PCO2 of 40, that was Dempsey did that. Even if they have a PCO2 of 47, they'll go up to 51. Right. And healthy people will go from 42 up to 46. So. Now, uh, there are various reasons for that, but they'll tolerate it. You want to keep their ventilatory drug and targeted non-invasive ventilation and fixed pressure support. There are no three, at three months, no group differences. So do you need really AVAPs? Well, probably certain people, but we pr probably, uh, I, I, 
some people think about it more than others. Uh, I, I tend to be not go to AVAPs very quickly at all. And I, in fact, when I'm surprised when people are on, a, I don't take them off AVAPs, but I'm surprised at how quickly some people pull the trigger on AVAPs. And for AVAPs, are you targeting that uh, ideal body weight, like the predicted body weight, and you use that for the volume to, uh, that you want to deliver? Okay, so my thinking about AVAPs is really going to be, I want to prevent deterioration during sleep so that I can improve ventilatory function during the day. And so the first thing is prevention. So I don't try to normalize them at the beginning. And then, uh, and then I, I proceed from there. I, I don't change settings very much, but I encourage things like weight loss and try to get these things, get rid of their, you know, their edema, get rid of their heart failure, try to improve their oxygenation overall and see if they can sink into it. And I don't know many, many people who have fine-tuned that afterwards. How many people do you guys, have you guys seen on, on AVAPs? And when, when I look at the output, I look at the minute ventilation, and, mm -hmm. and, and I sort of sit there and say, well, oh, that looks okay, right? Right. And, and so what's, which, uh, uh, Nishant, what's your minute ventilation? Over around six. Yeah, six to seven, right. Mm -hmm. You know, mine probably is more because I'm a heavier guy. But, you know, if, if you see that the ventilation is four, or you see the ventilation is 12. I'm just, I'm really remarkable when people are on these things and they come in and their minute ventilation is probably where it should be. Mm -hmm. Now, do we, should we do more oxygen saturation over time to sort of, sort of, pick these people up because the O2 sat can reflect what their CO2 is as well. But I think your hemoglobin, I think you do O2 sat overnight and you do the bicarbonate and you can get an idea of how we're doing. Um, I know this slide mentioned that three months is no difference in terms of like the PACO2 and stuff. Um, and then there's a couple of slides ago you'd mentioned within a month if you're not seeing a difference um, in terms of bicarb is that generally that quick in terms of like that A1C picture that you painted? Um, should yeah, you be yeah, about a month is okay. Yeah. Okay. But usually you're still struggling with trying to get people to get used to it. Get, getting used to it. And, you know, the ones you kind of document the adherence you know, the, the pressure's too much, which may be that the rate's too high or that uh, when the pressure is too much. I, you know, get them comfortable. Get them used to it. And then what's interesting is they gain, is they lose weight and then the pressure becomes intolerable because more of the pressure then goes to their, mm -hmm. in their to inflate their lungs. So, so this is for uh, hypoventilation syndromes, PCO2 greater than 45. This is for uh, respiratory airway disease. Another sleep term for stuff. And, and these are, this is the criteria that gets you onto a, to a, to a trilogy. And these are fairly simple. And you can see that they just say, well, show us this and we'll, we'll, we'll get them on a trilogy and we'll take them, take them home. And then, and then the question becomes, it's, it's, then the question becomes here, Eric, right. they come into my yeah. clinic on a trilogy and I go, what the, what? <laughs> should, you, should you have done like at least? No, least because they sit there and they say, who's going to follow up? Well, the, you know, the pulmonary fellows that put them on are not going to want to see him. Their attendings don't want to see him. You know? I, so I, we, we have those back and forth. We're going to reassess that. Okay. 80-year-old snoring, heart failure, atrial fibrillation now with a pacemaker, has recurrent central apneas, chain stokes respiration. Mm -hmm. I think those are all 30 seconds. So what's the cycle length? 
almost 60 seconds. So that's about right. 60 and yeah. 90 seconds. Right. Right. It's over. Got it. Episodes of three or more it's diagnosis, five central apneas that are central for hours sleep, crescendo, decrescendo pattern mm -hmm. for at least two hours a month. Treatment options. Short-term CPAP trials, 50% response rate, and an improvement in left ventricular function. And consider ASV if CPAP fails to reduce between to, to less than uh, 15. So now you kind of know in back of my mind, when people have central apneas on their CPAP, and they have 12, and everybody goes, oh, this is terrible. You know, because central apneas don't have as much effect on your blood pressure or cerebral blood flow as obstructive apneas. So it doesn't have as much morbidity. And then the ASV intervenes in the pathophysiology and improves uh, quality of life measures and cardiac parameters as well. And that was early Java Harry before the, before the, uh, the ASV trial was done. The short-term CPAP, CANPAP was not a uh, success, but more than 50% of the people on CPAP didn't change their event rate. So CPAP, and, and this is uh, circulation. And this is just shows that if you put people on CPAP, they improve their ejection fraction. What other treatment in heart failure improves ejection fraction? Oxygen. No. Nope. ACE inhibitors don't do it. ACE inhibitors don't do it. It's only stem cell. <laughs> stem cell okay. therapy proves it. Proves. So a 15% increase in injection fraction. Now, of course, you can have a, a person that has heart failure from viral syndrome and they get better spontaneously. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Cardiac transplant. So the uh, ASV has uh, you treat the EPAP with a, for the OSA. You treat the, the pressure support, which is uh, automatically changed, and you have an auto backup rate, and you have ASV. So that's the rest med. Rest med uh, and and the 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 brain that does the auto uh, pressure support, the time that it takes. The time that it takes for an auto back uh, backup rate, and even probably the EPAP that is if automatically determined if it if it if it is an A EPAP automatic EPAP. These are all different between the two devices, uh, Respironics and Respironics. Yeah. And Respironics came out with the first one. It was terrible. Well, it wasn't the first one. It was the second one, but it was terrible and. And Respite came out with the other one. It was better. Respironics then redid its whole system, and it was better. So the central apnea, flow drops, minute ventilation drops, pressure support increases, flow then responds, airway is open, ventilates patient, no change in EPAP. And then obstructive apnea is you just change the EPAP. If you notice the airway is closed, and that's the drop in minute ventilation. So those are the that's the problem of ASV with uh, air, airway obstruction, and that's what happens is that uh, uh, in the rest med system, and that's how they try to get over if you have residual obstructive apnea. ASV is maintained minute ventilation. So you can see here how the pressure support goes up. RestMed does a, a breath by breath br minute ventilation. They also give you a two minute minute ventilation if uh, in your printout and, and Respironics does two minute uh, minute ventilation. But, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, it does two minute and RestMed does a three minute moving window that is it, it keeps going and sees what it is. So it's comparing to the last three minutes what it is. Mm -hmm. And it does this.
maintain minute ventilation over a three minute. And what do you set the minute ventilation? Well, you try to set it a little bit less than what they need so their CO2 rises. And that may be the trick of the whole thing. It may be that if you let the PCO2 rise a little bit, that you engage respiratory drive, you keep rhythmogenesis, the tone of the airway, upper airway is okay, and, and rhythmogenesis proceeds, and the, the, ability, the amount of pressure support that you need on day 20 is much less than you need on day two because you breathe. How do you set the mini ventilation? You can minute ventilation with tidal volume, pressure support. Right, okay. Yeah, uh, and unless you already have a, uh, you have to look and see what the respiratory rate is and if they have a rate function, mm -hmm. you can sort of look at that, but I think you focus on really a minute ventilation. Most of the time, well, there is a, a a phenomenon that if you put a person on a ventilator and you put them on a certain range that between 12 and say 17 breaths per minute that they'll sink into that ventilator particularly during sleep and that's because of the afferent information coming from the lungs and the chest wall hmm. okay So you can see that red line at the bottom is the three minute moving average. And then uh, in this instance, you probably have uh, pressure support is increased and then you have to increase the, uh, and if it doesn't increase with the pressure support, you have to increase the EPAP. So that's how, that's how RESTMED does it. You know, I wish they would actually be able to print that out for you. Uh, that's one of the things that, that that's the next step for for uh, Anna May's work. She's getting a breath by breath throughout the entire night off the chip. So the next step is to get this breath by breath uh, in ASV machine, but it's a little more, it, we haven't broken that yet. Or maybe she has Jen told me. <laughs> so the serve HF was the one that everybody is uh, worried about, and this was a uh, this they they thought that because CPAP CANPAC didn't work, and RESPED put a lot of money into this, and uh, they wanted symptomatic CHF with an LV uh, less than forty five, and so that's and then they looked at a. Uh, uh, at the end, they had an increased mortality with the ASV groups. Now, the, this was not found really during the study itself. It was found in retrospectively, and it... Uh, uh, was all cause cardiovascular mortality, and you say, well, how, why wasn't that, uh, why wasn't that picked up? Well, that's because uh, all cause is not picked up. Individual causes are, and they were not statistically different until they, uh, they, they bundled it together, and then they, when they realized that, they, then uh, in the interim analysis, uh, about three months into the interim analysis, they stopped the study. Um, and those questions still uh, persist. There is a respironic study. Uh, I have not seen the results. Maybe you have. I, I, you know, I, I'll have, I was sort of waiting. That's the one reason to go to the annual meeting is to go and hear these people talk. and see what it is. But they hadn't found that signal in the, in the uh, ASV for the re respironics device. But it was a little different inclusion criteria. It was a little different uh, setting. It was mostly Europe. It was the United States. Mm -hmm. And most of these people died during the day. They didn't die at night. 
So the question was, was the machine responsible or was it the people that used it more often or less often or whatever it is, but they really couldn't tease out any of this. So it's contraindicated for this group that has a LV less than 45. There, people can do oxygen, which also improves central apnea at three liters a minute, but there are no long-term studies. And reimbursement won't occur in, unless you have an oximetry over time, not, not a sleep study, not a portable or HST, but you have to have oximetry. And you have to see the patient within a a month of, of ordering the oxygen. There are people who have tried dead space, that is put on a very tight fit and put the blow-by valve way down the tubing, and that increases PCO2 and increases breathing. And fronting nerve stimulation is still, is now approved by the FDA. It's not experimental anymore, but are you still seeing me? Yeah. Okay. So with the phrenic stimulation, you're talking about remedy, is that right? Right. Okay. We've been trying, there are three people, one at uh, UH and two at uh, the VA that people want to do. Uh, there's no, there's no, uh, uh, there's no one in town that does it and that what the people who are supposed to kind of get interested in doing it are the cardiac uh, 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 electrophysiology people and and they, they have to be trained in it and they have to do and they, they, they just are not very excited about getting done. So I, across the country, there are a few people that are there. There's somebody in Columbus, somebody in, in Ann Arbor. And, um, we're trying to see if we can send our people down to uh, the two at the VA. We can send down to Columbus and see what happens. So, so how, uh, how hard and fast is this? contraindication if you're using ASV for another reason. So we like had a patient at the VA, Eric and I, who and Nishant actually, who uh, is in heart failure, but the reason he's on ASV is because of uh, complex apnea, you know, treatment-induced central apneas. So, you know, so, they, were, they were saying, well, you can still use it as long as you counsel him because you're not using it for the heart failure and he's not, I don't think he's on, you know, uh, this specific uh, category of heart failure. So as long as you re counsel him on the risks, then you can go ahead and use it. What's your approach? Well, I, uh, let, me, let me just put it in perspective. I, I think I don't have experience with this. All I know is talking to other people and what they do. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, mechanism of action, even though it looks like it uh, keeps your breathing going on, it actually is set also to uh, be a somewhat continuous uh, process of minute ventilation that allows your PCO2 to go up by about four to 10 tor, and probably restores your breathing because it does that. So it evens out, like ASV does, it evens out your breathing. But it does so not because it, it gives you a normal tidal volume, it gives you because it's a little subnormal tidal volume, but you do it all the time. There is some problem with upper airway obstruction that occurs with it. I haven't seen that discussed very much. It, it certainly occurs in people with quadriplegia. Maybe it doesn't do it as much in in those with chain stokes respiration because they have a relatively normal upper airway. But uh, I would be very leery of trying it in things like opioids or other sorts of treatment emergent uh, uh, central apneas. And I, it'd, it'd be interesting to pull that person's record and look and see to what extent they manipulated the uh, the backup rate that manipulated the, the, the uh, tidal volume on the ASV. Again, if, if, if the AHI, residual central AHI is 15 or lower, I wouldn't even touch it. Okay. As long as, you know, <clears throat> oxygenation, I, I think it's 20% time or more below an oxygen saturation of 90%. 
that gives you the complications of hypoxic complications. It triggers the genes to make the proteins that make erythropoietin. It triggers the genes that remodel your pulmonary artery. It triggers these other sorts of things that go on. And because it's hypoxia reoxygenation, it probably triggers your uh, inflammatory response. So that's the physiology that I think is, is crucial. Got it. So BiPAP, auto SV, and VPAP, ADAP SV. And these are the sorts of various ones that you have between the uh, RESPED and the, and the Respiron, or and, and, uh, auto SV and then the VPAP. So you target minute ventilation, you have a backup rate, and you adjust the EPAP and you auto mode. So that's a, I can't imagine using a pressure support max of 28. Have you, have, have, you know, if we could, I would have brought out my BiPAP machine and have you guys all feel with 28 inspiratory pressure. So you, you, if, if you sit there and you generate 10 centimeters of water to be able to, to breathe with what you're doing now in your minute ventilation, and you had a pressure support of 28, you blow their head off. Yeah. And the most common setting in, in the intensive care unit for BiPAP, I, 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 I need to, I want to be able to do that again. I want to, the, the way you know what that is, is you ask all the fellows as to what you're supposed to set your BiPAP on if they come in and need non-invasive ventilation. Right. And the, the last time it was 16 over eight at one time it was 20 over 10. Hmm. okay i think they're more astute the central apneas treatment emergent sleep apnea Most, I mean, 90% of the time this goes away in three months. I, I don't know why people are pulling the trigger after one month. And then if, they, if the central apneas are less than 15 per hour, why they're pulling it at all? But we have certain attendings that are really excited about this. What's it like over at Metro? Do they get excited about ASV? No, I mean, is Auckland? Do they sit there two months later and they have a, a treatment emergent central apneas are picked up and or the 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 worst thing to me is they they do a, a split night, they find a pressure that gets rid of the obstruction, they have a lot of centrals and they go oh they must need this is the need and why don't you just wait? But that's me. Uh, I think they're they're generally pretty conservative as well. Uh, they've mentioned like the whole you know. Ideally, in three months or so, you generally see them disappear. Right. So you kind of wait and watch. Treatment emerge. They, but they definitely hop on the high pressure a lot more aggressively than you wish, I find. Yeah. The titration ones. So. The VA just like to switch from one to the next. Throw another machine at them. Yep. So here it is, Java Harry. Six groups, 0.5 at treatment emergency sleep apnea. So within uh, eight weeks, though, of that 6.5%, only 1.5% had CPAP persistence CSA. Right? So that's a pretty small number. See, 10% is 128, so it was probably about 78. And 78. So seven, they had three out of that 1,286. It's interesting, maybe an AHI of 80 or more than one a minute. Huh. 
he can reduce pressure because that's one of the things that uh, right. was shown, especially during titration, is over titration. And have you guys seen that where the tech doesn't realize it's central and cranks up the pressure and they get more centrals and then trying to like, what them. do I do? Mm -hmm. You avoid it because you get BiPAP with leaks and the ASV. That's why you wait, 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 wait. CPAP, most severe. And does ASV do, is ASV done in a split night or a whole night? All night. Whole night. And what's the major thing that tech does? Sit on their hands, right? right. Sit on their hands. And, I, I, what? and I it's do. very hard for some of these techs to sit on their hands, right? right. Okay. Neuromuscular disease, ALS. So that would be the other thing, Moshe, that's interesting is that what is the, uh, these are the criteria that you have to be able to do this. Yeah. But if you said, this is what, to, to what's the average NIP when people are referred to be evaluated? It's probably about 40 or 30. I mean, it's right at the edge in which they're falling off the table. Their PCO2 is probably not 45, it's probably 48 or 50. Their bicarb would be a better you know, look back. So if you're collecting your registry, you should, before they have their sleep study, before that, go back and look at the bicarb and if a blood gas has been done. And when was the first time that a, 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 a NIP has been done or a NEF or a MEP or NIP and, and what was their vital capacity if they ever had, had it done? Or was that the first time? Mm -hmm. I mean, the same thing with adult neuromuscular disorders. These guys really, they know it's important because they manage people with Guillain-Barre. What's the third name on Guillain-Barre? It's called Guillain-Barre. It's Guillain-Barre Stroll Disorder, as it turns out. It's the only disorder that has my last name on it. But it got dropped. wasn't, I don't know, it may have been related to Andre Stroll. Uh, options, BiPAP ST, and then AVAPs. Volume targets the volume. And this is where you set your volume. Oh, sure. This is where you look at eight mils mix per kg. So what is it if you're put on a ventilator and you have ARDS, what, what is it? Six to eight. Six, yeah. Six to eight. And it's also your ideal body weight, and it says that. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of the obstruction. Usually you start at just at four. People really won't know, won't feel four very much. And then you target your alveolar ventilation. Mm -hmm. You said you saw in six, six to four of what? What was that parameter? Well, four centimeters of water, uh, oh, six, to, six to eight milliliters per kilogram, right? Okay. For the setting of the, of the tidal volume. Mm -hmm. So you want to, so you set your pressure support and see what you get. And usually, you know, if you have chest wall problems like uh, kyphoscoliosis, you have to use, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you got to see what your volume is that you get with that, and you have to see what they tolerate. Now, the backup rate is too below resting. I think that's also applicable to the ASV as well. Mm -hmm. 
have you have you seen very seldom do I see people have set up a backup rate of ten. They usually say fourteen, sometimes twelve. Yeah, twelve seems to be the magic number. For that. So again, it's a target ventilation, they increase the tidal volume. Whereas the other one increases the flow, this is increases the tidal volume. So this is a volume ventilator. This is what they use in the ICUs, or at least one kind of ventilator used in the ICUs. I mean, the BiPAP doesn't guarantee a volume. So what trigger what triggers the inspiration in a VAPS mode? Is it volume or is it flow? It's volume. It's flow. It's flow like it is in everything else. Because that's the easiest thing for this machine to detect because your is going to be small. And then it then it set then it just goes for volume. Yeah, well, the patient's compliance is channeled with positional sleep stage. Volume will be delivered. So you got this, see this RESMED, intelligent volume assured pressure support. How about that? So the difference between the machines are one looks at tidal volume, one looks at minute ventilation. I've never seen an Astro be sent out of a, a hospital. It must be that Phillips has uh, been approved for something. Mm. They got the high. They got the. They got. They got something. It was a trilogy or their pricing as such? Phillips has a big presence in the uh, in ICU. I don't think there's any difference. In, people have not comp compared the two machines. Neuromuscular disease. You know, pseudo centrals. Hmm. Pseudo centrals can occur in, in anyone. Um, it just looks as though it's a central apnea. If you drop down an esophageal balloon, you'll find there's still residual respiratory factors. Right. At one time, we had EMG activity of the intercostal between the 10th uh, and 9th and 10th uh, rib. You can put in two electrodes and that'll pick up intercostal muscle, but it also your diaphragm is right underneath there. You can get EMG activity. If you're heavy, it's harder to get than if you're thin. But that's why you'll see in 1970s and 80s, the diaphragm EMG will be on some of the PSGs. And they may put it on the boards for you. So they, if they don't have a belt, look for an EMG on a, uh, uh, from an intercostal EMG. That's, that's interesting. I've seen that once in the boards when I, when I took them. And it was not difficult for me to figure it out, but other people were saying, boy, they didn't have a belt. It was really hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. Right. Does it make a difference? Standard buy level, auto titrating buy level. One month, random order, overnight PSG. No differences, small increase in, in auto titration. Now, I, I, so these are, these are, this is an interesting study design Moshi because you could take somebody and sort of, if you had a question and do a, you know, a, a, a crossover design, a certain ventilator or a certain thing or a certain this or a certain that. Right. 
especially if the illness doesn't deteriorate, uh, you know, faster than faster than a month. So a crossover would be good. You don't need to do very many people. 20 is probably a, a lot. Theoretically good. Pattern of arousal is attributed changes in, in, in IPAP. And that used to happen a lot. I don't know if it happens as much. Uh, used to have the original auto titration machine would change inspiratory pressures very abruptly. Now they change it over probably 10, 12, 13 breaths. Asynchronies reducing total sleep time. Uh, asynchronies being chest wall motion, an increased wake after sleep onset. I don't know. I don't know that particular reference, that Respir Med 2009. I don't know how, if that was if that was a, a big study or a little study. I don't know whether or not this was a big effect or little. So. so the. Uh, the, the plan over at the VA for the ALS patients, which are all service connected, is to put them on a um, AVAPS machine. First time somebody says, do you, do you want to, or has the, has the discussion of, would you want to be on non-invasive ventilation? And fortunately, they're talking about that earlier on, and that's why we do that in the middle of the afternoon. We do a, a a, uh, a VAPS titration in the middle of the afternoon for two reasons. One is uh, three reasons, actually. First is, uh, I, I don't know how standardized it's done, but the first thing you want to know is whether or not the patient and their major caregiver know what the purpose of this is all about. And if they don't, it's not the role of the technician or even the I don't know if it's the role of the sleep doc to sit there and tell them that this is uh, what you're going toward, not invasive ventilation, and that this is not a, a trivial decision. And, and, and usually if they have it, don't know what it's for, and they, and they haven't talked it over with their physician, the instructions are, well, uh, you know, see what you can do, but get them back up to their physician as soon as you can. Occasionally, once you explain what it is, they go, oh, no, I don't want to do this. So you send them back upstairs. So it, you, you want to make sure that's it. Second is to get them comfortable on a mask and have them breathe uh, on the mask and know what they're doing and how it is and what do you think and how comfortable is it. And this is the pressure and this is what it is. Because no, you know, people really haven't, haven't experienced that. And, whether or not, and then if they can fall asleep, that's, that's a bonus. But it's really not, even though it's called a pap nap, it's really not. The focus is not going to sleep. The focus is all, all the, uh, the introduction of therapy in a, in a fairly afternoon time. And that the caregiver really needs to know and educate on this. And it doesn't get, that's another thing, it doesn't get done on the wards very easily is for neuromuscular disorders to sit down there and do that. So the doc comes in and says, oh, gee, we want to institute this. And the respiratory therapist, the inpatient says, oh, this is great. I'll come in one o'clock in the morning and try to put on a BiPAP machine. Mm -hmm. So, and then a the problem with a pap nap in an inpatient is there you have, and if something goes wrong with it, you're sitting in a sleep lab with it with a PSG certified tech that knows how to do chest compressions, but doesn't know how to do anything else about patient care. And if the person can't move on their own, then they're stuck. Mistakes. CPAP alone, IPAP, EPAP span too close. That's why they put it at four. And, there, and, and what you can do, if you say, I want it less than four, you just put them on a, uh, a CPAP with an expiratory relief of three, and you're close to four. <clears throat> you know, backup rate too high, adjust over time. So 
daytime assistance may be needed, cough support. This is a neuromuscular disease. How about that, Socrates? They put in Socrates on it. Good job. That's probably why he took the hemlock, right? I agree with that. All right, here we go. Methadone. Let's see where we're at. Oh, there you go. And it's the chaotic breathing pattern. Both OSA, 44, corrected by PIPAP with a backup rate. Probably that's what you do. Your breathing patterns can be very, you know, just as chaotic. Anytime they show you something with really chaotic breathing, and they give opioids as a reasonable answer, answer opioids. When in doubt. Right. ASP is okay. I mean, I've, I, 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 I don't know. I, I've had a lot of people on ASP. And these are again persistent central apnea. This example. So these are, you know, you cut it down. You give them CPAP. They still have percent per, persistent central apnea. They're still taking their opioids. They need it for one thing or the other. Then you can probably think about it. But that already you're already down to half the people. Um, So if you persist your central apnea for weeks to months, then you can go to ASV. Just pressure support according to breathing, no studies. There may be studies now, so that's the summer. Okay, I sent that, uh, I, I sent this to Eric because I, it's the only email I had in my uh, AOL account. I can I put it to me and I'll send it around to you. Was that useful? Is that what you wanted to hear or is this completely different? I think it's useful to have those, uh, that overview and to go through sort of the different, um, you know, distinctions between the two systems, the, the different modalities. So yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I think it's, you know, just like you said now towards the end of the fellowship and always gives me wondering like what you said about the 10,000 hours, you know, and then I think we're just the beginning of it, right? So in order, I mean, at least for me, you know, being, yeah, you got to repeat this stuff again and again, but on the other hand that you'll be presented with these issues. And if you have sort of a back pocket idea about, you know, CPAP and then the, the other, the other slide shows the way you go down, but this, this is pretty, this is pretty good. If you have this, you can print out one, you print this summary out and have it, Right. Your phone or something like that. Yeah. I think from question marks. Uh, the talk I had done about the hypoventilation uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure, at the time when I was reading through stuff, um, there was uh, quality of life improvement and daytime sleepiness per se, but there was, yeah, there was nothing in terms of uh, VAPs suggesting like a mortality stuff at least yeah. um, for improvement in sleep staging and stuff like that. Um, it was more so like a quality of life type of thing that they're looking so, at. You know, it's it's sort of like the you know the you know the people who first kind of pointed out the importance of recognizing obesity hyperventilation syndrome coming out of a hospital showed an excess mortality that was just like thirty percent in two years. I mean, it was really mm -hmm. cancer like. But uh, to, and then they have this study in which you can prevent re uh, re or rehospitalization within right. some period of time, three months. There's really nothing in between there to sort of sit there. But yeah. those are enormous. So you have to have some funding agency or some company that is really interested to be because those are very expensive studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was there was some data on like the in in that quality of life questionnaire uh, readmission in terms of, or time spent in the hospital and admission uh, within, within a certain amount of time as well. That was kind of some of the metrics that they looked at as well. 
and I, I, you know, I think the population is important. If you had an EMR that was able to give you some of that information, maybe that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think we have a granular enough. Maybe the new um, templates will be more, but they're not focused on obesity. I mean, if you sat there and said, okay, I've got it. I'm an ER, e, uh, e, EMR uh, maven. I know how to do it. I will put in a recognition profile for for obesity hypoventilation as people come into the hospital. I'll put in that recognition profile based on no symptoms at all, just mm -hmm. on numbers. And I'll follow those and then I'll see what that happens and then I'll see whether or not uh, I, uh, there's an intervention and then maybe be able to identify uh, optimal care. But uh, I never really got into those sorts of studies because it really took a, a, you know, it took a village to do that sort of thing. And if I was the only guy in 1980, I was the only person at Metro doing sleep studies. I was doing it myself. I mean, that was not what I was going to do. And then when I came over to uh, 1984, uh, the neurology had the sleep lab, and they weren't interested in anything other than doing sleep studies, getting paid for it. And they marketed themselves for sleep apnea. And it continues to this day. I think we have very few people that refer to our sleep sleep study, a sleep lab from neurology. Hmm. That would be another thing to look at, uh, Eric, is to see uh, in our adult studies how many come from from neurology uh, versus come from primary care physicians. I bet the neurology group. <laughs> well. It really can be really kind of, and that's what happened when you when you're talking about it. People would say, "Well, okay, they get referred from the epilepsy monitoring unit, and in the epilepsy monitoring unit, you have EEG, and in our unit, we have oxygen saturation. You have a belt for breathing, and you have continuous 24-hour visual." records of the patient right and the consult is you know maybe they have sleep apnea you go wait a second it's like the same thing a referral that comes from either the intensive care unit or the cardiac intensive care unit they go oh, this guy needs a sleep study you say well he's been under your observation for 24 7 with breathing heart rate oxygen saturation and you can look at them and see, does, do they snore? And they go, oh, I don't know. Nurse didn't tell me they didn't snore. And you go, come on, man. Hmm. <laughs> you know, they gotta, they're doing everything except measure EEG. And then the, the other thing that's neat is when you go to the neurosurgical intensive care unit where they have the strokes, they got everything. And they even have EEG. And they still say, well, I think, they, I don't know. You know, like. I can't tell if they're asleep or not. You go, what's that signal? And they go, oh, that's EEG. And you go, well, why can't, can't you tell they're asleep with that? And they go, oh, no, it's not a very good signal. And then you go, well, why do you measure it if you can't measure it well because the fluorescent lights interfere with the frequency response? And they go, well, you know, we're a neuros neurosurgical ICU. <laughs> and you go, oh, dear. So you want to do a portable study in those, in those environments. Well, that's okay. All right, well, I'm talking too much. Okay, what are people doing today? 